There is no problem to be. God cannot solve it. There is no mountain to talk. He cannot move it. There is no storm to dark. God cannot come it. There is no sorrow to deep. He cannot soothe it. Carry the way of the world upon his shoulders. I know my God. The title of the message today is Ten Attitude. When God gave the Ten Commandments, He gave it in an extraordinary way. He called these people out of Egypt, out of bondage and slavery. They saw the plagues. They were, they have become independent by the hand of God and not by their own hands. They were enslaved not only of Egypt, they were enslaved of the culture, of religion, of the diet. And they have almost lost their identity. Then God came and God called the Israelite from Egypt onto the journey towards the promised land. But in between, God spoke to them in the mountain. And when God spoke, He spoke with thunder. He spoke with fear. He established His authority in Mount Sinai and wrote. 
his 10 precepts. Ellen White said that the Ten Commandment is God's written character. But if the Ten Commandment is God's written character, why does it start with the word do not? And most probably, we ask ourselves today, especially of the postmodern day, wouldn't it not, you know, was the Ten Commandment not so attractive? It starts with do not, do not, and do not, as if the people of God needed something, I mean, some restraint. So let me tell you that this was the idea that has been established for many, many years. Then when Christ would come, He has to really explain what kind of a character God has. Now let me compare. In Mount Sinai, the character of God is written by His own hands in the tablets of stone. And in Mount Sinai, Moses himself saw God face to face and saw the glory of God face to face and saw the mercies of God exclaiming, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, kind, giving mercy to thousands. And the glory of God was shown in Mount Sinai, but there is a glory more glorious than in the showing of the Ten Commandments. About thousands you know, and a half years later, the glory of God was not only shown in the tablets of stone. He was not showing His face nor His back. He wanted to show Himself in person. And so He spoke in another mountain called the Mount of Beatitude. Ellen White says, the Mount of Blessing. And during this time, people were oppressed, not with Egypt. They are not under slavery under Egypt. Yes, they are under slavery under Romans, but it's not the Romans that enslaved them. In fact, it's the religious system that enslaved them of another religion. A religion which Jesus Christ does not even recognize. It's a religion by the scribes and the Pharisees. People are longing to have freedom, freedom from physical enslavery from Rome, and another freedom from spiritual slavery from these so-called religious leaders, robed in white. So let me begin my reading from Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bibles with me, we're going to have a Bible study this morning. So read with me the Bible. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 says, Think not, and Jesus Christ is talking, and this is all in all red, meaning Jesus Christ is talking all the way. In verse 15 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law. This is not my purpose to destroy the law. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You know, every time people would feel that you are a threat, they usually eliminate you. And Jesus has become a threat now as He spoke. He has become like what? A rebellious leader, such as Judas and the rest of the history that rebelled against Him. But the reformation that He is about to establish is not a reformation of policy. It's not even a reformation of politics or governance. It's a reformation within each self. It's a reformation that liberates everyone from the bondage of sin. And so he begins to say, think that, that I am come to destroy the law. I did not come to destroy or to, you know, to make any changes with the Constitution. I am not against any Constitution. I am not come to destroy or to be a threat. I have come to finally fulfill it. And what does it mean by fulfilling? Fulfill the word Fulfill usually is used when there are prophecies. Onward, there is a requirement. If you're required, you ought to fulfill or to complete it. But this time, Jesus Christ is trying to say, I come to fulfill it. But the word fulfill has a greater 
you know, meaning. Fulfill means to expound. Fulfill means to, to exemplify. Fulfill meaning to explain. Or fulfill meaning to, to make something real. To make the ideal real. So in this verse, Jesus Christ actually is trying to tell that He wants to explain the Ten Commandments as a prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled, a messianic prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled in the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. According to the commentary, the Benson commentary, he said, He fulfilled in Himself all those predictions of the prophets which had been uttered concerning the Messiah. And He explained, He illustrated, He established the moral law in its highest meaning. He expounded it. He magnified it. And then both by His life and in His doctrine and by His merits and spirit, He prov provided and He still provides for its being effectually fulfilled in and by His followers. So meaning, today we are going to talk about how did Christ fulfill the Ten Commandments as a prophecy? How can we keep all the prophecies together and not even one is left behind because if we left behind, we actually fall with all. And then in verse 18 says, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it is fulfilled. So there is no other way but to fulfill it because the purpose of these heavens and earth is that we may understand the fulfillment of this law. Christ will fulfill every single letter of the law by His life and by His words. This is the real fulfillment. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these commandments or last least of the commandments and teach or even leave men, so shall he be called at least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So is this very important? Yes, this is very important. Because in heaven, all people are important and not least. For I say unto you that except your righteousness, and I would like to tag on this because I'm going to explain this more, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So if scribes and Pharisees are the most you know, obedient to the minutest of this law, how could you exceed the Pharisees? So Jesus is about to explain how to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And it's almost an impossible, an impossible thing to do. So let us begin to explore, I would say, the ten attitudes. Verse, first verse. Verse three, come with me. Let us read. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, is the, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, in my presentation, I won't be talking about the consequence of being blessed. Because this is not part. I mean, for me, I'm going to explore more on other things. But at least the first attitude that Christ wants us to understand because the first, you know, after His baptism, after His fasting, after the test, after the temptation, and after choosing the disciples, He spoke the foundation, the constitution of His governance. And the first ever decree that He has ever spoken is this, blessed, and this is most positive, because, you know, in the Ten Commandments, it talks about do not, do not, and do not. But this time, 
It's more of a positive, you know, approach. The approach was blessed. Makarius, something that is more than just joy and happy. This is something from within that you are satisfied. The satiety of living really as a Christian. Not just the joy, not just the happiness that, looks, that the looks can give. And so he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does the Ten Commandments say in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2 and 3? The Ten Commandments says, I am the Lord thy God that brought you out of Egypt, which have brought thee out of Egypt from the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Lord is trying to emphasize, you know what? You were nothing when I took you from Egypt. So don't left behind the first word in the Ten Commandments. Don't go right away to thou shalt not. Please realize that we were bondage to sin, we were nothing, and therefore by the realization that we are nothing, we owe God everything. So the first step to coming to Christ is that we should have a poor spirit. We should not have a proud heart. We should come to God realizing that we are sinners ourselves. Amen? We are sinners. And how did Christ fulfill this prophecy? Again and again, Jesus Christ is portraying that though He is the owner of the universe, He count Himself nothing of no reputation. And what is His character in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29 to 30? Come with me, He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I took my yoke. Take your yoke as well. And He said, Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest into your soul. How do you find rest into your soul? Re be meek, be lowly, look at me. And let me tell you, if you come to me, look at me, you will rest. Second point. Another blessedness in verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn. You know, if you realize that you are nothing, if you are poor in spirit, the second tendency is for you to mourn over things. First, you mourn because of your own sin. Amen? Realizing, looking at the what? At the mirror. And the Ten Commandments is a mirror. But greater than the Ten Commandments is Jesus Christ Himself, the fulfillment of the law. If you look at Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ wept over Jerusalem. Jesus Christ wept over the ladies of Jerusalem, Jesus Christ wept over Lazarus. And why does he mourn? You know, in Isaiah 53, he has a doctorate in sorrow. He's sad. Why? Because he carries the burden of the world. And yet he says, come to me, all of you who are tired and of heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This time, Jesus Christ is trying to say, that we should be mourning. Mourning is, um, is a blessed you know, event in our life because we see the troubles of this earth and yet we trust God. And according to Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 to 6, listen very carefully. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. But he adds, but those who obey me and love me, those who obey me and love me, I, sh I will forgive. I will have mercy for thousands of those that obey me and serve me. But let me tell you, people bow down to other gods and not realize that they ought to be bowing down and mourning to God instead of other gods. And in the following verses, enumerated by Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 5, He was trying to look at the what? The faults of the people. They are trying to mourn, and yet when they were mourning, they were actually proud of mourning. Let's look at Ma Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. It says, 
Moreover, when you fast, when you mourn, moreover, when you fast, do not be as the hypocrites. Do not mourn because you're acting. The word hypocrites means action star of a sad countenance for they disfigure their faces. They may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say to you, they have their reward, but thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head. Wash thy face. You don't necessarily have to be mourning in front of the people. You can mourn within your heart. Amen? You can ask. And I like the word secret here. He says, Thou appear into man to fast, but the Father which is in secret, the Father of secret, and, the fa and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Jesus would oftentimes go to the mountain and pray and mourn sometimes the whole night without people knowing it. He would mourn, he would fast because it's the only way to save the people, not by his own might, but the Father's power. And so in this, the prophecy is fulfilled. Matthew chapter 23, verse 36 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killest the prophets and stonest them are sent unto thee. How many prophets have I sent to thee, O Jerusalem? How often would I have gathered my children together, even as hen gathered her chick? chickens under her wings and you would not and Jesus would mourn over Jerusalem because Jesus Christ is the last resort if they would not accept Jesus Christ if they would not accept the Holy Spirit there is nothing more to be done for them and so Jesus mourns for them an eternal mourning number three blessed are the meek blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. According to the Ten Commandments, the third commandment say, says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord that, that your God will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. How do you take the name of an organization Carelessly. When you put your name along with ayas and does not justify it with your behavior, with an unacceptable behavior, you're using the name of the institution in vain. So in order for you to be called a Christian, obey. Because every Christian is obedient. To be meek like a, like a, like a sheep is to obey. But in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, Jesus cautions us in the same passages of the, of the, Mount, of, uh, the, the, the Mount of Blessing. Jesus cautioned us, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto, the, unto, Lord, unto me, Lord, Lord, using the name of God, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. And Psalm chapter 40 verse 8 says, the, to do the will of the Father is to keep His commandments. So if you say you're a Christian, if you say, Lord, Lord, and yet you do not obey, God will not accept you. In fact, the, best, the Bible says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in Thy name? In Thy name have I not prophesied? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Yes, we may find all the institutions baptize many people if we do not obey. If we do not obey the commandments of God, it counts to nothing. But Jesus Christ, again in Matthew 11 verse 28 says, Oh, sorry, of course he says, For I am meek and lowly in heart. Jesus is meek. And how meek is Jesus Christ? Matthew chapter 26, verse 39 in Gethsemane. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed. And he's saying to his father, Lord, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, 
but as thou wilt. That was the first plea that Jesus Christ did on Gethsemane. But the second plea was this. If it is not possible, the first plea was, if it is possible, the second plea was, if it is not possible, then thy will be done. You know, sometimes our children would appeal to us. And if our children senses that he can get what he wants, he usually would insist. But this time, there seems to be no answer. And so the question changes from it is, if it is your will to the, if it is not your will. And yet, did he obey? He did obey. And Ellen White says, the fate of the, of the earth trembles in the hand of Jesus Christ because if he would not obey, we would not have all been saved. Amen? Was he meek? He was meek enough to sacrifice himself. Number four. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. And this is the fourth commandment. And you know the fourth commandment because you're a Seventh-day Adventist. And what does the fourth commandment say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Blessed are those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. Do you come to church because you thirst and you hunger for righteousness, for holiness? Or you come to church because you have no other choice? Because your parents say so, because God would punish you if you won't. But let me tell you, this is more of a thirst for righteousness. 24 hours is not enough to seek righteousness. Amen? And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, look very carefully as Jesus expounds more than just fear. He says in 631, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Why would I go to church? What shall I eat if I go to church? If I worship today in the morning, if I worship in the evening, what shall I eat? He says, what shall we drink or what, what we are shall be clo will be clothed? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. God knows that ye have these things. But what God is requiring of you is this, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Thirst for the kingdom of God. Thirst for His righteousness. Thirst for holiness. And let me tell you, He is going to fill you of all these things. First, He's going to fill you with righteousness. He's going to fill you with what? His kingdom. And then He will provide you your needs, your physiological shelter, food, and everything. You know, it's like oh, often the conference would always say, do your best as a pastor. Do your work. We'll take care of everything else. The conference treasurer would always say, we'll take care of everything else. Just do your work. Amen? Do righteousness. Was it fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ says in John chapter 4, verse 34, He said, my meat, this was after He, he met the, the lady, on a bucket of water. He said, Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and finish His work. Mark chapter 2, verse 27 says, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So even on Sabbath, He works to sustain human beings. Amen? And... When he fulfilled, finally fulfilled the commandments of the Lord, he died on Friday and rested on a Saturday. Amen. Now let's go to number five. A little bit difficult. Getting more closer and closer to the ideal. Verse 11. I'm sorry. Verse 7. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And as I look at it in the fifth commandment, by the way, the first four commandments talks about relationship with God. Pure in heart. Mourn. You cannot mourn over your people. Pure in heart. Mourn. What else? Meek. 
and hunger and thirst. These are all relationship with God. But the next commandment talks about relationship with men. So look at very carefully because you cannot have mercy with God. You can only have mercy with people. Now, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. And according to the fifth commandment, the Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, and thy days shall be long upon the land which the Lord thy God has given thee. I was reflecting on this, just reflecting, you know, amazingly reflecting. Because when I was a child, I would always remember the hurts my father did to me. And many a times, I would imagine the day when I would grow up and put him in one side and tell him all the things he has done against me. The grudges I had. But let me tell you, in my life, I have learned. I have learned in my life that if, you ha if when we don't forgive, we tend to commit the same mistakes our fathers, our parents did to us. Amen? Again, let me tell you, if we do not forgive, we tend to do even more the things they have done to us because we dwell on the negative things. So if you, I have a question. If you cannot forgive or merciful to your parents, who can you forgive? That's the question I want to leave you. If you cannot forgive your parents, who can you forgive? You cannot forgive anyone. If you would not be merciful to your parents, you would not be merciful to anyone. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, just the same you know, verses that Jesus Christ was trying to expound the Scriptures and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from this evil of not forgiving. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. But for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And on the cross, Jesus was crucified but did not think of anything else but to forgive. He said, Father, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And often I would joke about this. When Christ would come today, maybe He would say, Father, forgive them for they do not do what they know. Huh? Here, they do not know what they do. But now we know. And God would still, what? Plea for forgiveness. Number six. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Bible says, thou shall not kill. And a heart that is not pure is easily provoked, easily angered. And think bad against their neighbor. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 26 says, Ye have heard what it was said in the old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Pastor, that's without a cause, but I have a cause. But let me tell you about the cause you have. Is it logical or illogical? Because many times we are angered and we don't even know the cause. And we are just making up, you know, all these causes together which are illogical. I am angry with him because somebody else is, you know, is good at him and not good at me. Very illogical. Envy. Yes, we are in danger of going to hell. If you say, you fool, you are in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring the gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first to be reconciled to the brother and then come and offer the, thy gift. For me, this is hypocrisy. If you go to church and yet you have hurt feelings, you do not talk to that person. This is hypocrisy. This is religiosity in its highest hypocrisy. And when I was a child, I learned of this song in Visayan. Biyae ang imong igasa kung adunay igsuon nga imong gidumtan. If you're, you know how Visaya works, leave all these things because this religious life is worth nothing if the heart is not pure. Amen? Pure from any grudges, pure from any what? Hate. And hate kills. 
hate kills not those you wanted to kill, but it kills you first. Amen? Jesus wants us to have a pure heart. Number seven. Blessed are the peacemakers. And do you think polygamy is making much peace? In the life of those in the scriptures, Abraham, Jacob, polygamy is never an ideal. It causes a lot of what? Conflict even until today. Even until today. It's not good. The Bible says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And adultery for me is what? War. It has separated many families, many couples, many spouses together. It has destroyed the world. Amen? It has destroyed the world. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, Ye have heard that it was said in the old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say to you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in, already in her heart. And if thy right eye offended thee, pluck it out and cast it off from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should cast into hell. And you know, in Job chapter 31, verse 1 says, I have covenanted with my eyes that I should not look at the lady with a lust. Why? Because it is not a peacemaker. It troubles your inner souls. Pornography does not give peace to anyone. Amen? It troubles the soul. It is not giving peace. It's giving more guilt. And I will say, Jesus Christ wants us to be free from all this guilt. And unless we cling on Him, we cannot overcome this malady. Amen? We cannot overcome this malady. John chapter 8, verse 10. When Jesus was faced with a what? With adultery case. And he has to decide. He decided on mercy, on peace. Amen? Jesus said, and Jesus had lifted up his, himself and saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And I think the only way to solve adultery is forgiveness. Amen? Forgive yourself if you have done wrong. Forgive others if they have done wrong. Never put a grudge within you because you will keep on destroying yourself. Number eight. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. If you are persecuted, not for righteousness sake, it's not persecution, excuse me. People often do bad things and when people, you know, react negatively to them, they say, I am being persecuted. It's not persecution, it's prosecution. Amen? Persecution is when people oppress you because of your belief, because of your race and nothing more logical than that. It's an illogical oppression. They are, you are being oppressed because of what you believe, not because of what you do. You do good things and yet they persecute you. But let me tell you, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 to 42. Of course, Exodus says, thou shalt not steal. What is stealing? Getting something that does not belong to you. Five verse 38 to 42 says, Ye have heard that it has said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, wanted to take something from you and take away thy coat, literally steal legally, to steal something legally, to sue you, and say all sorts of things in order to persuade the court. But what did Jesus Christ say? 
And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him, Twain. Don't worry about the court. Give him. Don't worry about the court because there's a court in heaven more just. Give him that asked thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou thy way. Give it. So I would say we'd not, we would not only, you know, we are not only bid to not steal. If people would steal to us, just give it. This is a Christian attitude, amen? A positive attitude, just give it. You won't lose anything. But what about Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In fact, they were stealing his clothes and gambling over it. He does not care. Amen? He does not give it. You know, I remember the circumstances of Joseph. Joseph, because of his coat, his, you know, brothers was jealous of him and took his coat, put a blood on it, and tell his father that he's dead. But let me tell you, Jesus' coat was, had a blood on it. Amen? So that we could be coated by Jesus Christ Himself. What about Joseph? You know, Joseph. Yeah, Jacob. Jacob and Joseph. Both have circumstances of coats. But let me tell you, Jesus is willing to give up everything as long as your character will be carried in heaven. The character of forgiveness, the character of giving, and not worrying too much about this earth. Don't worry about your food or drink. Another. Verse 11, number 9. Blessed are you when they revile you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Take, word, take the word falsely. Because the ninth commandment says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against your brother. What if they bear false witness against you? How do you re react to it? The Bible says, Blessed are you when people persecute you, revile you, and say all sorts of false accusations against you. Why? The reason is given after in, ver in the next verse. But let me tell you, in Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48 says, Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. This was the regulation during those days. But Jesus Christ wanted to twist them and explain to them, expound to them what it is to be Christ-like in character and to obey the real commandment of the Lord. The Bible says, Ye have heard that it was said, Thou shalt love thy, thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. Amen? So be good to those who, are, who do evil to you. This is Christianity at its highest. In fact, second to the highest. For he maketh his son to rise over the evil and on good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward ye do? Yes. Sorry, let me read this again. Falsely. Again, ye have heard it was said by them on the old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, for shalt perform unto the Lord thy oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, nor by in God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is thy footstool, neither by Jerusalem. Why? Because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let, me tell, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than this cometh of evil. Jesus Christ is expounding lying. And what is lying? When you say something and you don't do it, 
It's not bearing false witness against others. It's bearing false witness against yourself. Amen? So we, if you cannot make your appointment, just email me and tell me I cannot. Because if I'm expecting that you still can and yet cannot, I'm expecting. Amen? And it hurts. And it hurts not only me, it hurts you, your integrity. The consistency of yes and yes and the consistency of no and no is your integrity. If it's not consistent, yes and no together, you do not have integrity. Amen? Jesus wants us to live with integrity. And if people say, yo, this, people is no, this person is no, people will prove that you are yes. Amen? They cannot destroy you because you are consistent in all manner. Finally, and one of the most important things point I want to do. Because all of those blessedness start with blessed, blessed, blessed. But at the end, it starts with another word. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. In the original, it means to jump with ecstasy. Like a victorious person. Like it, you have already gotten the end of the road. And you know, all apostles are dreaming that they would come to this character that even if they kill him, it is their privilege to give their lives. And for them to die for Christ is the highest privilege. So if you complain you're not ready to die for the Lord, you, you take away the privilege that God has given you. But these days, you know, persecution seems to be very what? Very bitter, and death seems to be not the way to real Christianity. But Jesus said, Come to me, come to me and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And if we follow the Lamb wherever He goes, we follow Him even into the slaughter. Amen. It's easy to say, to say than do. But let me tell you, this is still the ideals of the Lord to sacrifice for people. And how did He? You know, exemplify this. The Bible, of course, says, Thou shalt not. Matthew chapter 15, verse 27 to 30. And with him they crucified two thieves, and one on his right hand and the other on his left. But in Matthew chapter 15, he says, Pilate answered to him, Will ye that I release unto the, you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy, for covetousness. People were covetous to him, wanted to kill him because of their covetousness, and yet he gave his life freely without any covetousness. Covetousness also means selfishness without giving. Not giving. Sometimes we think, I will only give if he deserves. If he does not deserve, I will not give. But let me tell you, Jesus gives even if you don't deserve. Amen. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, the highest of all these ideals, Jesus said, of course we know that thou shalt not covet. Ye, shall, ye have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you, persecute you, and ye may be the children of thy Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise. And I've already opened this before you. Today, Jesus Christ is like saying, if you're really a Christian, rejoice whenever there are adverse circumstances that test you of your integrity with Christ. Amen? The Bible says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great, and this is the attitude, the attitude that looks heavenward. I may suffer today, but I will reap the reward later. Amen? So if you have this salvation within you, secured within you, you are not insecure of anything that happens to you in the outside. Because they shall kill the body, but not the soul. Amen? They shall kill the body, but not the soul. Today, Jesus has shown us both by His conduct and by His doctrine that we should live like a Christian. And how do we live? Keep the commandments, not by the letters, by, but by its attitude. Two more verses, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 4 says, Therefore, 
Now there is no condemnation to them which is are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So obeying the law by the letters is walking according to the flesh, but obeying the law with the proper attitude is walking under the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement, the attitude of the law, might be fulfilled, not only in Him, in us. Amen? Fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in His steps. Brothers and sisters, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And there is no other longing but for all of us to have these ten attitudes before we shall be in heaven. Shall we pray? Gracious, mighty, heavenly Father, thank you for the precepts of the law. Thank you for the letters of the law and thank you also for the spirit of the law that was expounded in the life and in the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us today to follow him wherever he goes, to be patient and not only to see the fulfillment in his life, but the, 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 to see the fulfillment of the law in our own lives so that other people may see that you are indeed a good God that is merciful, kind. Help us, Lord, to be peaceful. Help us, Heavenly Father, to, uh, to magnify the law in our lives. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for the message that you have given us today. Help us, Lord, to live in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. In Christ's worthy name we pray. Amen. God bless you.